Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm from Graham. Ahead today, multiple new attacks against Israel, terrorism near Jerusalem, missile strikes, and increased fighting along the northern border with Lebanon. Those battles come as Israel votes a decisive no to a Palestinian state. Another front in Israel's war, this one on our phones. We're going to hear from an Israeli group taking on anti-Semitism, which exploded online after Hamas's October 7th terrorist attacks. How pro-life groups and others are reacting after the Alabama State Supreme Court ruled frozen embryos outside the womb are children. And with a crime, with crime being the top issue for millions of Americans, we're going to hear from one longtime community development leader about spiritual solutions to mend the hearts of young people. All those stories and more coming up right here on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. Lots to get to today. Let's begin in the Middle East, where Israelis were met with a terrorist attack outside Jerusalem today. Missile strikes near the city of Alat in southern Israel and an escalation in the battles along the northern border with Lebanon. Those attacks come as the Israel's government overwhelmingly votes no to a Palestinian state imposed by the international community. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the story. She's in Jerusalem. The Knesset overwhelmingly backed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's statement that Israel rejects international attempts to impose a Palestinian state. The people of Israel and their elected representatives are united today as never before. Such an attempt will only endanger Israel and will prevent the genuine peace that we all seek. Israel came under attack on multiple fronts Thursday morning. Aerial defenses intercepted a suspected Houthi missile launch heading for the Red Sea city of Eilat before it entered Israeli territory. And outside Jerusalem, three terrorists with automatic weapons fired on vehicles stuck in traffic at the main checkpoint into the city, killing one and wounding 11 others. Civilians shot and killed two terrorists at the scene, and security forces arrested the third. And an anti-tank missile from Lebanon made a direct hit on a home in northern Israel. No injuries were reported. In Gaza, War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz says the operation in Rafah will begin after the population is evacuated and will continue during the Islamic holy month of Ramadan if there's not an outline for releasing the hostages. The war in Israel is fueling a global rise in anti-Semitism, especially on U.S. college campuses. A study by the Simon Wiesenthal Center of nearly 30 universities shows a free pass to promoting a pro-Hamas, anti-Zionist agenda. I think that Jewish students need to demand and should get just equal treatment to everyone else. Every other group is quote-unquote protected, and, uh, and, they, uh, and they should be. Rabbi Abraham Cooper says anti-Israel forces off campus are creating a poisonous atmosphere. Going to the streets, blocking airport entrances, uh, and generally driving a narrative that now focuses on uh, the Gazans who are um, uh, in the middle of the firefight, of course, only placed in danger because of Hamas, but uh, mm -hmm. with Israel no longer able to push the concerns over American and Israeli hostages still being held by Hamas. Meanwhile, the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel submitted a report to the UN documenting brutal, intentional, and widespread sexual violence by Hamas during the October 7th massacre. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. I want to turn now to another front in this battle. A number of cyber experts claim the war for Israel's survival is literally in our hands. Our phones are now a major weapon in the fight over which narrative we believe. Here's CBN's Middle East Bureau Chief, Chris Mitchell. As Israeli soldiers are fighting in terror tunnels deep under Gaza, another war against Israel rages in cyberspace. Tal or Cohen Montemayor launched Cyberwell in 2022 to create a better real-time picture of online anti-Semitism. October 7th was a turning point. 
Since October 7th, Cyberwell tracked a massive uptick in online anti-Semitism with a 29,000% increase in Arabic tweets saying hashtag Hitler was right. Post October 7th, I think something changed and it became very clear that social media platforms are now a matter of national security. They can be exploited by terror organizations and by foreign governments in times of war. This is now happening for Israel but it could happen to any Western democracy that found itself in a war or under attack by a terrorist organization. Hamas documented their atrocities on October 7th, but almost immediately came online denials. This conspiracy theory is acting in a very similar way and with a very similar purpose to Holocaust denial. But there's a really big difference. Holocaust denial was proliferated by these very extreme groups. If ever people were brought on to be interviewed, they'd be hung out to dry by traditional media. Social media targets the youth. What we've seen today is that the younger generation is more pro-Hamas, romanticizing Osama bin Laden, being exposed to pro-Hitler content online. And I think that what we're seeing is a culmination of anti-Western, anti-Semitic content being widely believed by the 30 and under crowd, which are using these platforms sometimes as a major news source and are certainly engaging with content online anywhere from 15 to even 100 hours a week. Cyberwell produced a video to expose the denial of the Hamas massacres. You really know what happened on October 7th. You've been lied to. We all have. Palestinians didn't behead babies. What? Didn't put babies How can they even say that? Didn't rape yeah, they didn't we were there. Something can never be erased. Mate Mayor says anti-Semitism online has real-world consequences. Talk about foreign policy of the current administration, which is now currently in the process of strong-arming Israel into recognizing a Palestinian state because they saw in the polls that their base is not happy about the current policy of supporting Israel. And I think that social media plays a huge role in that in terms of again, swaying opinion and also shifting people to be openly hostile against Jewish people and Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, the fallout from the Alabama Supreme Court's ruling that frozen embryos are children and the potential implications of this decision, plus the pushback against a controversial treaty that would give the World Health Organization more power. We're going to have both of those stories for you when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching CBN News Watch. Get your daily quick start from CBN News. A quick read on the important news of the day delivered right to your inbox. Stay current on breaking news, politics, and entertainment. Go to quickstart.news and subscribe today. The Alabama Supreme Court's ruling frozen embryos outside the womb are children quickly got attention across the state and across the country. A major medical center in the state has put in vitro fertilization procedures on hold as it examines the impact of this decision. The pro-life movement is also weighing in on the ruling's effect on their efforts to limit abortion. CBN's Mark Martin is on the story. The Alabama Supreme Court's decision is unprecedented. The justices ruled that under state law, frozen embryos qualify as people, stating unborn children are children, without exception based on developmental stage. We're concerned that this ruling has far-reaching consequences for what we feel is safe to freeze um, and safe to discard. The court's decision could hinder patients' access to fertility treatments. The justices found three couples can sue for wrongful death after their embryos were accidentally destroyed. The president of the Alabama Pro-Life Coalition says the court got it right. I think they did, and I think most of the pro-life community would agree uh, that that is a correct decision. It's something that uh, it has been discussed from time to time, but this issue is really a new issue. It's something, as I said, different from abortion, and it's much more complicated than abortion. Uh, but we do have to respect 
life and the way life is created. And that's exactly what these embryos do. The CEO of Americans United for Life says the decision strengthens the personhood movement, which says unborn children should be granted legal rights starting at conception. I think it definitely advances the cause of the personhood movement with the understanding that uh, preborn humans in vitro or ex vitro are due the benefit of life for sure. Liberty Council's Matt Stavers said the nonprofit law firm is using the Alabama court's ruling in a similar case, arguing that Florida's constitution, like Alabama's, affirms that an unborn child qualifies as a human life, a human being, and a person. This is a very significant case, and we actually have notified the Florida Supreme Court of this decision because of another major case pending in Florida at the high court there with regards to abortion on the ballot potentially in November. Alabama's largest hospital put on hold in vitro fertilization treatments Wednesday, saying it must determine the risk to patients or doctors of potential criminal charges or punitive damages. Mark Martin, CBN News. Turning now to a controversy over a potential international agreement, the World Health Organization is warning of future global pandemics, and they are pressing member nations, including the United States, to sign on to a treaty giving it broader authority. As Lori Johnson reports, the WHO's questionable decision-making during COVID is raising some red flags. WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus suggests the next pandemic could be possibly more deadly than COVID-19. And anything happening is a matter of when, not if. So we need to have a placeholder for that, for the disease we don't know that may come. And that was when we gave the name Disease X. Given his concern, Tedros wants countries worldwide to sign a legally binding agreement full of rules and regulations giving the WHO expanded authority. This 32-page document is the most recent draft of the so-called pandemic treaty that the World Health Organization promotes as a way for poorer countries to receive the same level of health care as wealthier ones. Some Capitol Hill lawmakers have major concerns about this push, including the WHO's handling of China's role at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. The WHO denied that COVID-19 was spread via human-to-human -human transmission, based entirely upon the word of the Chinese government, the CCP. And I think maybe most appalling is the WHO even delayed naming the pandemic a public health emergency of international concern because the CCP confirmed that the spread of the virus was, quote, under control. Others charge it would use U.S. tax dollars to fund certain health policies worldwide. You know, WHO has lost its way. I used to ask them, I've been here 44 years, year in and year out, where do you stand on abortion? They'd say, agnostic, we don't do anything on it. And now they have become the most aggressive promoters of abortion in the world. They have a, and, and, and is embedded in this treaty. The Family Research Council's Tony Perkins calls the treaty a progressive power grab. The draft agreement is first and foremost a global, political, economic, and social manifesto. That threatens U.S. sovereignty. Few Americans save those who desire to exercise control over the lives of others, would want to see another pandemic like COVID-19 and the government response that followed that pandemic. Given the scope, critics say this amounts to a treaty and should be put to a vote in the U.S. Senate. The WHO refuses to call the pandemic treaty a treaty. It calls it an agreement, an accord, a framework, anything else likely because it does not want it to be submitted to the treaty process in the United States and worldwide. Another major sticking point is that approval would allow vaccines, treatments, tests, and other information to be shared. The draft would require parties to support time-bound waivers to intellectual property and use WHO TRIPS provisions to override intellectual property rights, which will curtail future investment in health research which is exactly the opposite you would want to respond effectively to a future pandemic. 
Experts say that information sharing could be a deal breaker for the U.S. and other nations. WHO leaders have set a May deadline for the document's approval. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Still ahead, crime is a major concern for millions of Americans, but what are the best ways to stop it? We're going to hear from one longtime community development leader who's talking about spiritual solutions which can change the hearts of young people. We've got his story right after this. Although violent crime fell about 12 percent across the country last year, it increased in cities like Dallas, Memphis and Washington, D.C. So what's the solution to better protect city neighborhoods? Appearing on this week's episode of The Global Lane, Robert Woodson of the Woodson Center says racial division must be rejected. Instead, he believes Americans must come together and seek spiritual solutions to mend the empty hearts of young people. <laughs> the death of George Floyd, where progressives have vilified the police. And as a consequence, you have what they call the Ferguson effect, where police are less aggressive in enforcing the laws in some of the high crime neighborhoods. And as a consequence of this uh, vilifying the police, they're less aggressive. And so crime goes up. That's one of the causes um, of it. And, and so we have been fighting against that. 80% of the black community who are suffering in these communities are against defund the police. But a lot of the social, social activists on the left continue to promote this vilification and attack on police with the dire consequences. They don't live in a neighborhood suffering the problem, so they don't have to live with the consequence of their advocacy. Yeah, it's easy for outsiders to come in and say, do this, isn't it? And I follow local news regularly. It seems like there's a shooting or murder almost every day right here in the seven cities of coastal Virginia. And many politicians and community organizers would say that tougher gun laws are the answer. That hasn't stopped the high murder rate in Chicago, other cities that have tough gun laws. So what do you think should be done to reduce violent crime? Well, not only do I think it, I've had experience in reducing violence. We have, when, when uh, a lot of this violence is being committed by a very small cohort of people who are generating it. What we do is we recruit what we call Josephs. We are, we are pe people who are from that community who represent community antibodies. In other words, whenever there's injury to the human body, healing begins because the body is equipped with antibodies. Well, the same phenomena occur within the highest crime neighborhoods, sickest part of the body draws the strongest antibody. They are healing agents, people who through God's grace have been redeemed and transformed, and they have moral authority and the social trust of these young people. And when you enlist them to engage these young people and witness to them uh, that they are making the wrong choices, and when you support them, they have the ability to, to redeem and transform these young people. Uh, and so those who have been leading other young people into uh, 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 negative behavior, they become agents of change and we have changed. People have been converted from predators to ambassadors of peace. Last summer, in one of the most violent neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., for 100 days, we didn't have a single violent incident of any kind. And that's because of the presence of a group called the Alliance of Concerned Men. These are ex-offenders who God's grace have been redeemed and transformed, and they exercise this kind of moral authority with the young people in the community with the result that they disarm themselves. And so it... That's what we've got to get behind. We've got to support healing agents within these communities, people that have the moral authority and the social trust of these young people, and therefore they can guide them to lives of responsibilities away from violence, and they, but they are agents of their own uplift, and that's what we've got to promote. We're not seeing a lot of love in our society today, are we? What, what's the cause and more solutions? It's okay. It, First of all, the problem is not racial. We have to be transracial. I mean, we really have to, to understand race is a distraction. Um, and so, so what we, Rick, the high, according to Harvard study, that the highest form of deaths occurring among 
white kids in suburban there or, or Silicon Valley, the suicide rate is six times the national average. The highest uh, cause of death of young people in Appalachia is prescription drug and homicide in the inner city. And that's because when young people are growing up with a hole in their heart, life does not have content or meaning. They devalue life to the point where they'll take their own or take someone else's. They're different sides of the same coin. That's why we must put race aside and come together the way the Woodson Center is doing. We're bringing, we have thousands of groups called the the Voices of Black Mothers United, they're coming together with white mothers from, from Appalachia and Silicon Valley and what we call the Mothers Consortium. So we can come together and seek solutions across race and class lines so that we can begin to come up with strategies to fill that emptiness that's in the hearts and souls of our young people. But we can't do it if we are constantly in this tribal conflict on the false issue of race or injustice in society. Okay, churches can lead the way. Robert Woodson of the Woodson Center. I've been talking with you about these issues for nearly 40 years now. You're still out there leading the way to bring about neighborhood revitalization and transform lives. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you and God bless you as well. Also on this week's episode of The Global Lane, a look at China's influence on the Hollywood film industry and former President Trump or President Biden, who members of Gen Z support and the candidate they want chosen for vice president. You can watch The Global Lane this evening on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app, or you can watch it on YouTube. Coming up, we're coming back with an encouraging word for your day ahead. Stay with us. Download the CBN News app, one place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Get the CBN News app today. Time now for your Thursday Thankful. I invite you to join me in this prayer of gratitude. God, thank you for the very air I breathe. You are the source of every opportunity to inhale and exhale. Simply that. You're the giver of life. May we all value that gift and use every moment to give our lives back to you. And with that prayer, make this a day filled with gratitude and thanksgiving. Truly a thankful Thursday. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time. You can also find them online at CBNNews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us. The address is newswatch at cbn.com. Of course, you can reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye. God bless.